Don't you guys see the screen? You guys able to see it? Yes? OK. OK, yeah, so um, the first uh, presentation you're going to do here is Seven Deadly Sins of Sight Casting. I originally did this at the Western Canadian Fly Fishing Exposition in Calgary here. Um, did that presentation. Ross Purnell, the editor of Fly Fisherman Magazine, presented right before me. He saw it, went, I love it. Can you get me an article for that, for the magazine? And I went, well, it depends when you need to buy. <laughs> and did. And then I ended up presenting this quite a few places. I did the podcast with uh, Tom Rosenbauer on this. And then the next time I was out in Manchester, Tom asked me if I would do the seven deadly sins of streamer fishing. So we're going to kind of go through both those presentations. Normally, um, normally I would do one of them and go into more, a little bit more detail, more examples on each, but we're going to kind of plow through a little bit more because I was talking to Brian. I think he said that both of these might be of interest. If you guys have questions, I'm happy to stay as long after as anybody needs, um, but we'll just kind of jump into it here. So when we're talking about sight fishing here, it's just, it doesn't matter if we're talking about flats fishing, if we're talking about dry fly fishing, we're streamer fishing or nymph fishing. This first presentation is gonna cover all sight fishing. So it doesn't matter what type of fly or what type of technique you're using. These principles will apply to all sight fishing techniques. So let's jump into it. First one, Brian mentioned do a lot of photography. Um, photographers are terrible for this. We get people to wear bright clothes, stuff that looks good on camera, stuff that looks good in a magazine. You look at this, this photo here, friend of mine, Paula was fishing with me. You can see the difference there where she was supposed to be on camera. This was planned. This wasn't an accident. She didn't know that, oh, well, a bright color would spook a bit. She's very aware of that, but she was the one that was on camera. I was not the one on camera. I was the one searching for and spotting fish at this time. So you can see the difference in the clothing that the two of us wear because if you wear bright colors they stand out um i had a couple of years where paula fished with us a lot um and i had a, an office manager at the time those two fished a ton it was very strange for me to get phone calls in the morning from two females saying what colors do you want us to wear because they're trying to coordinate colors because they knew most of these photos were ending up on social media and then magazines were giving a lot of attention when you have two females in the sport obviously that was something that drew a fair bit of attention and so you know you, i'm getting phone calls me who can hardly dress myself let alone figure out style has you know females asking me what color to wear as photographers we're terrible for this but the bright orange the bright pinks the purples they look great in photos they show up really well to a fish as well Right, fish are camouflaged. There's a reason that a you know a chartreuse or a bright pink fish wouldn't uh, fare real well in the wild. Okay, the second thing I want to talk about, and the second kind of big mistake that a lot of us make is this rushing in. Uh, there's countless um, examples I can think of where this has cost me a big fish, or an important fish, like this photo. You see, this is a very common scenario for us on the bow. We'll fish big dry flies from the boat and then we'll stop on a bank where we know where there's often sipping fish and we'll get out and walk it or just stand and watch. And so I'm standing there with a the buddy and just watching for fish to start rising. Even though I've stopped intentionally on the bank, even though I know where the fish should be and I feel like I'm walking so slow and I'm trying not to rush, I still spook fish because I go too fast all the time. It's it's crazy how often, like I compare this a lot to if you've ever bow hunted something like a whitetail on foot and not in a tree stand. If you don't want to spook fish, you need to do that one step, stop and watch for 45 seconds. One step, stop and watch. Even though I know that, even though I really try hard to do that, I still spook fish constantly just because I didn't take my time. I didn't go in slow. The whole 90% of the fish are caught by 10% of the anglers couldn't be more true than when we're talking about this sort of thing. The best anglers I've ever met, the best anglers I've ever guided, the best guides I've ever worked with, none of them are in a hurry. You know, they know where there's a time and place to move quickly, but they're never going to rush. And it's amazing how often you see like you go back to us being little kids and you think that you're supposed to wade to the very top of your rubber boots and that's where how deep you're supposed to go. 
Well, as adults, we somehow think that the zipper on your waders is the line that you're supposed to wade to. And it's amazing that people, you'll see people get out of their vehicle, walk from the parking lot into the river, and the first time they stop walking is when they hit the top of their waders. Instead of taking the time to observe and watch, look for patterns, look for rising fish, just to take your time and observe. There is nothing that I think makes as big a difference when you're sight fishing as just taking your time and watching first. Um, so many examples that kind of go into here. We're gonna move a little faster than usual, but a really easy one to think of is think of something like blue winged olives. I've had this before where we're at the vehicle and you're getting geared up and we're just covered in spinners, covered in spinners. Now, do you tie the fly on then or do you tie your fly on when you get down to the water? And it's funny because I've gotten the habit of this. Nauto, who's actually, our, Brian mentioned the head guide. I'm not actually our head guide anymore. It's Nauto Aoki. He's our head guide. Um, we're in a habit of not tying a fly on with people until we get to the river for this type of reason. If you tie on, um, you tie on what you see all over your vehicle when there's either tricos or when there's blue winged olives hatching, and you're gonna be covered in spinners of one gender. You're gonna have males all over you. How often do those males return to the river to lay eggs? Never, <laughs> right? It's only the females that return to the egg to deposit their eggs. There's a lot of different species of mayflies. On those two specifically, the males and females are totally different colors. If you match what you see at the vehicle and then rush down to the river and start casting right away, you, you didn't match what's actually on the water. Going to the water, taking your time, ignoring bugs that may have crawled all over you while you're on your way to the river and actually observing what bugs are on the water at that time. It's amazing how often, you know, you might have caddis flying everywhere and they're landing all over you while you're putting your waders on. You get down to the water and they're not actually eating caddis because those are all caddis that hatched last night and what they're actually feeding on is a few sporadic PMDs. So taking the time to not rush can make such a huge, huge difference. All right, this drives people bonkers when I'm with guests and I'm guiding, but there's probably nothing I've done um, to help more guests achieve significant results when they're dry fly fishing or just sight fishing. Because again, whether we were casting a nymph to that fish or a streamer, doesn't matter. It's just, we're talking about sight fishing where we spot the fish first and now we're casting to a fish that we already see. This three rule drives people nuts. So here's a shot um, of a cuddy coming up to feed. I love going out and taking photos like this. This is a photo I took, you can see in the right hand corner. I think you guys can see my mouse. You can see that midge is on the water there. There were also a bunch of PMDs on the water that day. They wouldn't touch any of those. The only thing that they were eating was tiny little beetles, probably size 18 and 20 little beetles. They were super hard to see, you couldn't see them with the naked eye. When you took a photo like this and I was shooting with a 600 mil lens, you could actually see what they're eating. There's a, a sequence before where you see the bug and then this is the second shot in that sequence where he actually engulfs that bug. So many of us, when this fish comes up to eat, you can see the white of its mouth, fish comes up, we get excited, we set the hook, the fish's mouth is still open, so we've yanked that fly right out of its mouth. We just flossed its teeth at a ridiculous rate. What's the first thing that most of us, if I could talk, what I would say is, what's the first thing that most of us do? We set the hook, we miss the fish, you go, oh no, and we slap it right back on the water, okay? So you just floss that, teeth, that fish's teeth at a ridiculous rate. That fish is startled and it's alarmed. And now you put that same fly right back in front of him, put it right back in his wheelhouse so he can see it, look at it and go, yeah, that's the thing that just startled me. That's what's wrong. I'm out of here, right? When someone misses a fish and they set that hook, I'll actually sometimes grab their arm to make sure that they don't recast. I'll bring the line in and I cut the fly off. It drives people bonkers, but if there's no fly, they're not about to recast. I have spent hundreds of hours photographing fish with no rod in my hand. I have never learned as much about fish until I stopped casting to them and started just observing them. And that was it. I've watched a fish feed 
500 times one fish just going crazy on a blue winged olive hatch that ate and ate and ate and ate and you see rhythm and you learn body language and you see you learn so many things about a fish the first time that we miss a fish like that their body language changes and usually that fish goes on full alert and now that fish is really worried if i throw that fly right in front of him again that fish is probably done because i've just showed him what he's scared of and now why would he eat it right where if i wait let the fish get back into a rhythm and when you watch the first time a fish eats again after we miss them they'll come up and that fish will eat really hesitant and then they drop quickly you can tell that they're not comfortable you can tell that their body language is not showing ever any level of comfort the second time they come up they'll come up a little bit slower and they eat and they still drop faster than usual but you can see they've relaxed a little bit you eat let them eat a third time I cannot think of one of those fish that we have not hooked. If you let them feed a third time, they'll eat again. I've had people miss fish eight different times and we got them in the end and every single time I made them wait three times in between and people start bargaining and well, what if it doesn't rise again? What if this happens? What if that, what if it's gone? Then we'll go find another fish. If you wait and let that fish get back into its rhythm, and you cast to a fish that's comfortable instead of a fish that's spooked, you're gonna hook exponentially more of those fish. And again, I don't care if this is a permit or a cutthroat trout like in this photo or a, a brown trout, you let that fish get back into its rhythm, you're far more likely to hook these fish. Okay, the third one that we're gonna go into here is this movement on the bank. You can see in this photo here, Obviously, this is actually a screen grab from video. Um, in the video, you can see I'm laying down, so I'm not moving. But what's the first thing when all of you guys are looking at the scene and you're looking at the, this river running through the mountains, as soon as I start doing this in the corner, where does everybody's eyes go? Why? Right? Like Brian said, I did my master's thesis on the visual characteristics of expert fly casters and then how manipulating attentional focus will affect outcome accuracy. I spent way too much time in a lab looking at our eye movements, at our eyeballs, and everything to do with vision. The first thing that our eyes pick up on is movement, which is why when no one's moving on that right-hand side of our screen, our eyes drift back to the actual scene in the middle. As soon as I start doing this, people's eyes tuck up into the corner because everyone sees that movement. Our eyes are drawn to movement. It's the first thing that we're going to see. The second thing that we see is edge detection. It's why it's so much easier to see the angler in blue than it is to see me laying down on the bank. It's not that the color is that different. It's mostly just, you can't see a clear definition of where my edges are, where I end and the rocks begin. That's when camouflage works well, is when you lose that edge. You see a very clear edge on the angler wearing the blue shirt, right? And so movement is one of the first thing that gives us away. What's the first thing that usually draws your attention when you see a rising fish? The movement, right? When a fish feeds on the bottom, you see that flash, something catches your eye. If you can see the fish, they can also see you most of the time, right? And so to be very cautious about movement. The kind of classic example I have of this, the best dry fly season I've ever seen on the Bow River. It was uh, just about 10 years ago now. Now Toe and I were, uh, were floating with another one of the guides. It had been unbelievable spring. We're on the river with another guide who we hadn't fished with um, that spring. And he was really complaining that he's like, man, the dry fly fishing has been brutal, isn't it? And we're going, uh, it's probably the best we've ever seen. So I, I don't know. So we'll see. I said like, maybe today it'll be normal and we'll see. And we can show you some of the spots that, that we've been doing really well in. And he's like, ah, oh, man, I doubt it. it's just been terrible. And it was super pessimistic and, and negative about it. The first place we stopped, got out on the, before we were able to get out, his dog was in the boat with us. His dog jumped out of the boat, jumped up on the bank, which was about six feet above the water, ran 50 yards up the bank, turned around, raced 50 yards back down the bank and stood above the boat waiting for us to get out. And now Joe and I looked at each other and went, all right, let's just hop, keep going. And he's looking at us and go, well, like you guys said that this is the bank that we got to check. Like, why wouldn't we fish here and go check it? Like, well, there's no point if your dog just ran up that bank. He's like, well, that won't matter. We go, well, absolutely it will. When there's movement, 
If a fish is sitting in shallow water, which we get a lot of fish, and especially our big fish that'll sit in super skinny water close to shorelines, if they see movement and they see a black shadow coming down the bank, they're not sticking around to go, is that someone walking their dog? Or is that an eagle diving in to hit me? Is that an osprey that's about to dive on top of me? Or is that a great blue heron? Or is that an angler that's here? If they see that movement, they're just going to spook and they're going to be gone. Any type of movement can give away your position faster than anything else. So be very cautious with how quickly you move and when you move. You know how when we get a window that opens up when you're trying to look in the water and you get that clear window that opens up? Never move when that window is there. If you can see the fish clearly, and that's when so many people, they see that window and as it starts to travel, they spot the fish and they go, okay, I need to stand here to cast. While you can see that fish, don't move because they can see you as well. When you see the fish, mark the spot. As it starts to swirl and you lose that window and you can't see the fish anymore, that's your opportunity to move. All right. Number four. This is such a cardinal sin. This one's a simple one and it makes me laugh. Um, I had a buddy started guiding the same time as me. Uh, I was trying to pay for university at the time. So my truck was used, my boat was bought used, you know, my rods were decent enough, but they weren't the most expensive anything on the market. He had a new truck, he had a new boat, he had the nicest everything, he'd spent so much money and he had like $10 gas station sunglasses. And we would go to the river and we'd be looking at a fish and be talking about where, I can't see it, where, where do you mean, show me. And then he would, hey, let me see in your glasses and he would put my sunglasses on and then he would try to accidentally walk away wearing my sunglasses all the time before I caught on. I was like, dude, get over here. My glasses go by a pair. Sunglasses make a huge difference having proper polarized glasses. This little chart that's in the middle here, there's a lot of different lens colors. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on lens colors right now. If you have questions after, ask them. But as a general rule, anything that's kind of that yellow color is going to help brighten light on flat days. So if you've got low light, early morning, late evening, cloud cover, any of your coppers, browns, um, bronzes, those are best for our freestone river. So anything with earth tones, that gives you your best color separation so that you can see better into a river stream with vegetation on the bottom, with ro rocks on the bottom, those lenses are best. So many people spend a lot of money on a good pair of polarized glasses that have black, smoke, dark gray lenses which are the perfect lens to use for blue water fishing. So if you're offshore, that's the ideal lens to use for that type of fishing. It's a really tough lens to use. You're not gonna get great color separation if you're trying to use those types of lenses when you're fishing in a freestone river situation. Sunglasses are worth their weight in gold, not just for safety goggles either. All right. <laughs> Like this is, a, that's actually the, the previous picture that I spoke about earlier. So that's the little beetle that was about to be engulfed. Um, and you can see that that midge was obviously flying down uh, towards the bottom of the screen because in the, in the previous shot, you can see that this little midge right here was actually down here by the time that cutty ate that little beetle. Um, yeah, and that cutty was ignoring all the PMDs. It was ignoring all the midges. All it cared about was beetles and it would swim around the circle and, and just eat the beetles. So. The whole point of polarized glasses is we want to be able to see in the water and see the fish before they see us. And proper lenses will make a huge difference. Again, right, you want the clarity to be able to see in the water. It's amazing how far we can see underwater if we've got the right lenses to work with. Okay, the next kind of cardinal sin that I run into um, when we're talking about sight fishing is the number of people that walk away from a situation if the fly is too small. So top photo, salmon fly, you see the natural and you see the foam imitation of it. That's the bug everybody wants to throw, right? Everybody wants to throw big foam, something they can see. They know it's going to float. They know they can see it. The fish often hit them hard and aggressively. That's great. But how many salmon flies do you see on the water? And how long is the salmon fly hatch compared to the blue winged olives that you can see blanketing the water in that bottom photo? That bottom photo, that water does not have cotton wood fluff on it. It's, it's not, see, those are all blue winged olives. And we will get hatches like that that blanket the water and the water literally looks furry. 
but typically we're looking at size 20 to probably 24s when we get those. Um, same with our midges hatching early in the spring. Our blanket hatches are typically really, really small bugs. A lot of people get really put off and say, you know, I can't see something that small. So I'm just going to ignore that fish. And it's probably some of the most enjoyable sight fishing opportunities that we'll run into. Um, if you think about tricos or blue winged olives, when there's mats of them like this on the water, it's one of the few times that fish will ignore their camouflage and ignore safety. You look at most fish trout in a river that are feeding and they're not gonna feed right underneath the surface because if they feed underneath the surface and say four feet of water, there's too much separation between them and the bottom. Just like what we were talking about with edge detection before, when there's that much separation, their edge, their silhouette stands out so well that ospreys, eagles, anything like that that's going to dive from above can see them too easily and they will target them. That's why they'll slide into really shallow water where they can sit with their belly right on the bottom where there's not that edge detection. Their camouflage works well. That's why they'll sit in four inches of water instead of feeding on the surface in six feet of water so commonly. When they're right below the surface like this, though, it's one of the only times I'll see them do this is blanket hatches of uh, midges, tricos, blue winged olives. And they'll just gulp, 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 go, and they eat like crazy. And it's so, it's so visual, it's so exciting to watch them. They feed so aggressively that to ignore this just because it requires a size 20 fly would be a mistake. And I know so many people that will go, you know, I'll fish a size 18, but a 20 is too small. If it's a 20, I give up. and a size 18 might look way bigger than all these natural blue and olives on the water. But what happens if I line up a row of cupcakes in front of a bunch of four-year-old kids and one cupcake has more icing than all the rest of the cupcakes? Which cupcake gets picked first? Every single time. And the exact thing would happen with all of us adults if we were honest and we didn't think that someone else was watching us and we weren't counting calories and all that other garbage. We would take the one with more icing right? Same thing happens. It blows my mind how often when there are thousands of naturals on the water and they're all a size 20, they're all a size 22, and you throw one size larger. You throw a size 18 in the middle of that and they eat that fly almost immediately. There are thousands of naturals around them and floating by constantly and they picked yours first. Does it look the most like a blue winged olive? I really doubt it. It's a little bit bigger. It's a little bit more food source. I'm assuming, like, we don't know. We make up theories that help us sleep at night. I do a lot of that. That's why I don't sleep well at night. Um, but the reality is it's going to stand out just a little bit. If you're competing in a crowd, you need a reason for yours to stand out a little bit. Now, if I throw that giant salmon fly in the mix, I will probably spook any fish in that pot, right? Because it's too big a fly. And I've seen people say, oh, I'll cast way above it and let the fly drift down to the fish. And when a fish is sitting so close to the surface where they're just eating and eating and eating and eating, they can't see as far. Their, their field of vision is much less. The deeper they get, the wider their field of vision is. When they're right below the surface and eating, they don't have a really wide field of vision. And all of a sudden, this hopper is right on top of their face. And I've watched so many fish flare so hard that they stop feeding and that they vacate the area. When there was no drag on the fly, it was not cast within 20 feet of them, but it just all of a sudden showed up right in their face and it startles them and they take off. You know, they'll often come back and feed again after, but if you go too big, you can spook a fish. Go one size bigger than what they are. If that's still too small for you to see and they're feeding on nothing but size 24s, throw a size, throw the smallest fly that you can still see. If you throw a size 18 elk hair caddis, that's a pretty easy fly to see. Run a tag two feet behind it with whatever your dry is, even if that's a size 24 that you have trouble seeing. Whatever the smallest fly, the closest size you can get to that imitation, put that on and just now you're fishing a hopper dropper, but it's a hopper and you've got two dries on there. If you see a fish come up anywhere close to your little caddis or your pointer fly or that pointer fly moves even slightly, just set the hook. Um, here's the thing when we're talking fly size. So I learned some really interesting things this year um, when I was 
again, not fishing, but photographing and taking high speed video of a bunch of fish. And so I spent a day here where I was um, taking a bunch of high speed video and I saw some things that were really interesting and, and um, I'm glad I stopped taking photos to take the video because I learned something really neat. So these fish were within 30 yards of a bridge and a day use provincial recreation area. Super common place, see a ton of pressure. When I go photograph fish, I want to see high pressured fish. I want to learn what a fish that is under a lot of fishing pressure does as opposed to a fish that's never seen an artificial fly in its life. Um, I didn't have a rod, so I took a little butterfly net <laughs> and caught a bunch of grasshoppers, threw them in the water. This fish, it looks like it's eating this grasshopper. This fish refused this natural hopper. That's a real grasshopper on the water. There was a bunch of fish in this pool on this pod. I had to throw 26 natural grasshoppers in the water before the first one got eaten. They would come up and follow it and flare, come up and follow it and flare. Why? It's a real grasshopper because they've seen so many artificial grasshoppers. The majority of the flies they see are the biggest fly that someone can throw because it's the easiest to see. So very quickly, they start to associate a large size with danger, right? If there's only 10 natural grasshoppers landing in the water every day, but there's 500 artificial grasshoppers being thrown in the water by anglers, and the majority of the time they eat a grasshopper, it's got a sharp pointy butt, they're gonna start to get pretty spooked by big grasshoppers, right? If you start fishing smaller flies now, I think this should be, yeah. So see the tiny little um, mayfly inside the mouth of the, the cutthroat there? You see that mayfly? That is the nymph was starting to emerge. It wasn't even fully out of its shuck yet. But this fish ignored all of the bigger flies, ignored the naturals, but would just eat the little flies in rhythm, just eating like crazy. Why? Because they were safe because a fraction of the fishermen throw small flies compared to the very big flies. And think how many naturals, let's go back to this picture, right? Look how many blue winged olives are on the surface. So if they're eating small flies, they have to eat quantity. The only way they can eat enough of those little flies to make the volume they need is quantity. They eat a whole bunch of them. So if they eat, this is what they have to eat the largest numbers of, but this is also what they're seeing the fewest artificials of. It's what they become the least leery of. It's why in our mountains, like Brian, when you fished on the old man with us, early in the season, you can catch all those fish on big foam. Later in the season, big foam is going to catch a fraction of those fish and all of a sudden it reverses the other way where the majority of the fish are going to be caught on small flies because now small flies are seemingly safer. They eat way more naturals that are small that they don't ever run into an issue with. So small flies become the much safer option. So by just avoiding a fly because uh, you know it's, it's too small, you're missing out on some of your kind of most exciting um, sight fishing opportunities. Okay, jumping into the next one here. Scanning too far. This one is not really self-explanatory, but here's what I mean. So if you look at that right there, you see that trout note sticking up. So that's a, a rainbow that was feeding super soft. That's the that's probably one of the biggest rise forms it had in about a 45 minute period of us being there and me trying to photograph this fish while also coaching someone through casting to this fish. And the fish was rising super, super subtle. And you can see it was right behind the little ledge where water was spilling over an island. And so there was, there was a lot of disturbance on the water. It was hard to see the eats. And this fish was only eating tiny little PMDs. And so the problem was, is when the angler was casting, the fly would land up here above the fish and start drifting, he would lose the fly. And so what happens to most of us when we lose the fly? If let's, let's use this air bubble right here as the example of that's where the fly landed. Well, as soon as you don't see your fly, what's your natural instinct? Oh crap, I don't see it. Maybe, maybe it's not here, maybe it's over there. I don't see it, maybe it's over here. Oh, I don't see it, so maybe it's here. Maybe it's here, maybe it's here. And now your eyes are jumping back and forth and back and forth and you're scanning everywhere, trying to find it instead of just watching the area that your fly landed in 
and then follow an air bubble. Like, look at all the debris you can see on the water. Uh, there's bugs here. That actually, I believe, is was debris, not another insect, another insect, another insect. Your fly is going to travel at the same speed as an air bubble. It's going to travel the same speed as another insect on the water. It'll travel the same speed as some sort of debris on the water. If you lose your fly, just follow the area that you know your fly was in. If you see a trout snout appear in that area, set the hook, right? You don't have to do a Bassmaster, I just shattered three vertebrae in my back hook set and spook the fish. But if you lift and the fish isn't there, just wait, let him get back into his rhythm and feed again. And then you'll cast and you'll probably hook that fish. When you scan quickly, you can't actually observe um, what is in the scene. I shouldn't say observe. Your brain doesn't process the information. So in the scientific community, instead of calling it an eye movement, they call it a saccade. A saccade just means eye movement. Eye movements happen at over 900 degrees per second. So if you think of your visual field being 360 degrees, think of the fact that your eyes can travel just about three laps in under a second. Your eyes can move so quickly from one side of the room to the next, that your brain can't possibly process all of that information. So what it does is it just suppresses the information until your eyes slow down again and you start actually tracking something. So you can identify a moving object, but that's when your eyes are actually looking at something and they remain within three degrees of the visual field um, for at least 100 milliseconds. Your brain needs 100 milliseconds to process what's there. It's why for any of us in the group old enough, to talk about the subliminal messaging they used to put into um, films where they would put in, you know, they could put in two screens um, of popcorn or a drink. And all of a sudden, while you're watching this movie at the theater, you go, you know what, I'm really craving popcorn. It's because it showed up, but it showed up so quickly that if it's only there for two frames, you know, there's 30 frames a second, um, your brain wouldn't actually process that you saw it your eyes wouldn't say that you saw it, but your brain would start thinking about, you know what, I'm thinking about popcorn. I'm gonna go buy popcorn. That actually got outlawed. They weren't allowed to do that because that subliminal messaging was tricking people. If your eyes need enough time to see something, if you're scanning rapidly, you won't see your fly. And so you will also miss the E. I wouldn't be surprised if 70 to 80% of the fish I've had guests land on small flies, I could not see the fly when I said set. Could not. I saw the fish come up. I knew where the fly should be. Sometimes the fly is right beside him and they set and it's wrong. I said, nope, my bad. Put it in there again, right? Sometimes you'll be wrong, but the majority of the time you'll get it. If you scan too quickly, you're gonna miss it. Um, I don't know if you guys have flat fish before, but is there any worse feeling than being on the bow of a flats boat when the guide on the polling platform says, fish 60 feet, two o'clock. And you're going two o'clock, I don't see it 60 feet. I'm not, and you start to don't see it. So now you look at three o'clock and it's not there. So you go back to two and now you go up to one o'clock and it's not there and you jump to four and then you jump up to 12. And, and now you're looking all over the place and he's going, it's at 50 feet, he's at 40 feet, cast man, cast and you start to panic and your eyes are moving everywhere, you're processing no information that actually does you any benefit. If your eyes move too quick, you can't actually see what you're looking for. So just slow down. If you can't see the fish, if you can't see the fly, look for other cues, such as a shadow of that fish on the sand, such as you know the flash of that fish underneath the water. Look for, you know if you can see the fish and you can't see your fly, just watch the fish. If the fish comes up and eats, set the hook. Right? Or just follow your fly line and then run a line up in front of that fly line. A classic example of this is a permit, right? Like permits a fish that you can see it so well and then all of a sudden it turns broadside to you and you think you should be able to see it better and it just vaporizes and it's just gone and you can't see it. But just like underneath Kosh, Kosh is our, uh, this is Akasha, he's our hosted travel manager. You see his shadow? so often that's what will give away a fish. So instead of me panicking and starting to scan everywhere so fast, you know where the fish just was. If he spooked, you'd probably see the boil and you'd see the water blow up. If he hasn't spooked, look for the shadow. Look for something else that's gonna give away that fish's position to make your cast instead of rapidly, all of a sudden jumping all over the place with your eyes and now your eyes can't tell where anything is. 
All right. Number seven here. Proper presentation. This is Tim Rajeff. Some of you guys might be familiar with Tim. He's the inventor of the Echo Rods, world champion in both accuracy and in distance casting competitions. His brother is Steve Rajeff that works for G. Loomis. Um, Tim was one of the guys that was casting in my thesis. I got to know him pretty well. Unbelievable caster. One of the reasons I use him in this photo is there is not a situation that I've seen on the water with Tim where he didn't have an appropriate cast for it. He doesn't just throw the same cast. He'll change hands. He's a right-handed caster. He'll cast left-handed if he needs to. You know, we need to do the same thing with our presentation when it comes to that fish. If you've been watching that fish and if you took your time and you didn't rush in, you'll know this is a fish's rhythm. Some fish feed on such a set rhythm, it's, it's mind boggling. I've seen a fish that ate five times in a row. Every single time it ate five times in a row and it ate in about a five foot wide box. It would eat, it would eat, it would eat, it would eat, it would hit the edge of the box, it would turn around and it would eat and it would eat and it would eat and it would eat. And it just went back and forth in that box, right? If I don't take the time to actually watch in a rush in, I would miss this. But then now my presentation has to match this fish's behavior. I know that if it ate here, it never doubled back. It always went all the way to the edge of that imaginary box and then it turned around and it fed all the way back. So if it fed right here, and I cast where I just saw it feed, it's a wasted cast, right? My presentation didn't match what that fish is doing, right? The thing that I see happen so often is you'll see a fish that it'll feed twice in a row and then it'll pause. Or you'll see a fish that'll feed three times in a row and then it pauses. And they feed three times in a row, sometimes within like 30 seconds, but then it'll pause for 10 or 15 minutes and then it'll feed three times in a row and it'll pause. Well, when it's fed three times in a row, and then someone throws a cast, what are we doing other than educating the fish that this is an unnatural that you probably shouldn't trust when you start feeding again in 10 minutes, right? I've sat there and watched a fish for hours at a time and it always fed three times in a row. So it, and it's not because there was a lack of bugs, there were still bugs drifting over that fish's head. That was just its natural rhythm. My presentation has to match their rhythm. If it's on its natural pause, there is no point in me putting all these casts over its head and just teaching the fish, hey, this fly is not real. When you see this, when you start feeding again, you can ignore it because at least, you know, I'm happy if some of my casts are drag free, let alone trying to have every single one drag free. And so the more times I put my fly over top of a fish's head, the more likely I am to make a mistake and the more likely I am to educate the, that fish that this isn't real. When you start feeding again, go ahead and ignore this one, right? So we got to make sure that our presentation is going to match that of the fish. That makes sense? So that's the end of the seven deadly sins for the sight fishing. Um, I can jump into questions right now on that, or we can go into the other one. Do you guys have a preference? Um, trying to see that's if right. there's... Yeah, let's, why don't we keep jumping in, Josh, keep moving. Okay. Okay, so. Great yeah. so far. Thanks, Brian. So, yeah, yeah that photo, I, I enjoy this photo. This is, this is such a hard photo to get because when a fish eats an artificial, it's one and done. Once they, once they hook it, they know it, that's not a natural, they're done. You know, you, I've taken photos of a fish that's fed hundreds and hundreds of times in a row on naturals. But as soon as you put that artificial in their mouth and somebody sets the hook, you're done. So it's so much harder. You got one shot at this. And so it's pretty fun trying to get these shots. Um, but honestly, I spend more time trying to take these photos nowadays than I do actually trying to fish for these. Oh, we can skip this. All right. So the seven deadly sins of streamer fishing. This is going to just be streamer fishing in general. It doesn't matter if we're talking pike, if we're talking trout, if we're talking gin clear water, muddy water. This is, this is going to be um, the seven things we want to make sure that we think of or, or consider in kind of all streamer fishing applications. The first one, Brian, I'm sure you deal with this a ton, is 
at the shop, we get people coming in all the time and I want to start streamer fishing. I need to buy a sink tip line. And you look at, there's so many different options. You can have a floating line. You can have a sink tip line. You can have multiple different speeds of sink tips. You can have a poly leader and you get a lot of people that are like, okay, you know, I just, I, I don't want to spend this much on a full fly line. I just want to buy a poly leader. There's certain situations that poly leaders are great for. If you don't do a ton of streamer fishing and you want to have a poly leader can be a really great fit. But one of the things that we see a lot is, so we have a lot of bull trout in Alberta and a lot of people that are coming here specifically to target bull trout. They're sitting in deeper, faster runs. A fly line, a sink tip fly line has a much larger diameter than a, a mono leader does. And so everyone thinks I need to get down, I need to get deep, so I gotta buy this expensive fly line. And they buy themselves a fly line and seeing three or four feet of water, they're trying to get down in 20 feet of water. And they've only got a 10 foot sink tip. And the problem is they cast into that pool and the upwelling currents push their fly and their fly line right back up to the surface. In that situation, they would have been better off to fish a floating line with a long leader and a heavily weighted fly. There are certain situations where you would want to fish an unweighted fly with a heavily weighted fly line. And so making sure that your line selection actually matches up with the application. And I see a lot of people where this catches them up. Like I'll see people that buy a poly leader to go fish from a drift boat in the spring when the water's high and it's colored and all those fish are stacked against the bank where they're casting the same amount of line. And so on every single cast, that loop to loop connection goes tick, 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 as it goes all the way through the guides and it only gets seven feet outside the rod tip. And then they start stripping and it goes tick, 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 tick through every guide. And then they recast and tick, 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 tick all the way through. If you're fishing from a boat and you're fishing a consistent distance from the bank, like you would when you're pounding banks, having a sink tip line can make such a huge difference for you. So making sure that your line matches up with the scenario that you're actually fishing. No, it's everybody wants to buy one line and be done. There's different lines that are going to fit best in different situations. There's no question that a floating line is the most versatile line that you can get. You can do more with a floating line than you can with a sink tip or a full sink, but um, every line has its proper application and the time and place. You just need to make sure that your line isn't what's kind of hanging you up. Leader length. This is an interesting one. So I see this a lot. People come in, they buy a sink tip line, they're going to go streamer fishing, they're super pumped, they've heard about these big fish that they can get throwing streamers, and so they buy their sink tip, and they're going to fish, let's say, on the left here. So this is the Bull River, that's a brown trout, you can see the water's not real clean. It's just after runoff. So there's still a lot of color in the, in the river. And then they put a nine foot tapered leader on. And so their sink tip goes down and their fly is still on the surface, right? They've got this huge long leader that is preventing their actual sink tip from working for them, you know? And so a lot of people ask, well, how long a, a leader do you run on a sink tip? On a sink tip, I'll start with about two and a half feet. That's kind of my go-to start. If I'm fishing the water that you see on the right with a bull trout here, where it's gin clear, I might go much longer than that because when the water is that clear, then I want that fly sitting further away from, from my sink tip. But I want to make sure that I don't have my fly sitting on the surface while my sink tip's down on the bottom, right? And vice versa, if I'm fishing with a floating line, I want to make sure that on a floating line, I've got a long enough leader that a heavy, heavily weighted fly can actually sink and get down to the bottom and it's not going to get stuck. You're not going to pull a floating line underneath the water very easily. So you want to have a much longer leader. Your leader needs to match whatever your fly line setup is. The clearer the water is typically, the longer I'm going to run that leader. When you've got dirty water, I always say fish as heavy as you can get away with. When we streamer fish the bow and it's muddy and dirty, it's, I would fish steel leader if I can get away with it. You know, the fewer flies we break off and the more big fish we land instead of having those fish break us off, the better. But the bow can get this clear. If the bow is that clear, you know, you can't fish 20 pound test mono and have a fish not flare on that. You're gonna have to go much lower. 
fish as heavy as you can get away with in that scenario. And then the cleaner the water, the clearer the water, the longer that leader needs to be, obviously. All right. In the streamer world, this has gotten a little bit out of control. And I'm super guilty of it. This is my favorite thing to throw. I love throwing big flies. I love throwing flies that other people look at and go, is that a whole chicken? You can't cast that. And I, well, that'll be fun. I really enjoy casting big flies. I also really love from a photography standpoint, remember before photographers ruin everything, we do it here too. This looks really cool in a photo, right? That's a 16 inch long fly hanging out of that muskie's mouth, right? And so we throw these huge flies because big fish eat big meals, right? Sometimes, yes. All the time, definitely not. One of the bigger bull trout I've landed is on a Crelix minnow, right? That's a super small little fly that's not even two inches long. The biggest brown I've ever had a guest land was 28 and a half land, inches long on the Bow River. It was on a probably size six clouser minnow, a brown and white clouser minnow, right? I love throwing big articulated streamers. I love fishing streamers aggressively and quickly. We'll go into some of that later, but try and match your fly size to the situation. If the water's really dirty, bigger flies can be great. If the water's super clear, a giant fly might spook every fish in that pool. It might spook every fish in that bay. You know, if you've got highly pressured fish and everyone is throwing small flies, well, then a big fly might work. There's been kind of a, this transition in recent years where, you know, 15 years ago, and let, let's go back 20 years ago when I first started working in the industry and working at a shop, people talked about a Bow River bugger, a size two Bow River bugger as these giant streamers. Like I was throwing really big stuff. It was like two and a half inches long. And we considered that a huge streamer. Nowadays, most people consider that, you know, a mid-sized to smaller streamer because they're so used to, you know, all the Kelly Gallup flies where you've got all these articulated streamers and, you know, I just throw meat and all, all this stuff where it's become a little bit macho in this bravado that, you know, you have to throw a bigger fly and flies got bigger and bigger. Giant flies worked really, really well when everyone was throwing tiny little flies because they never saw that. It's the reverse of the grasshopper and the midge thing, right? When they never saw those huge flies, they worked really well. Now that everybody's throwing these big flies, we've got a bunch of pike lakes around here that are super highly pressured. And it is so hard to catch big fish on big flies now because everybody and their dogs started throwing big flies. We've got people that can't even cast the big flies anymore. So all they do is troll them because, well, they're getting big fish on big flies. I need a big fly. I can't cast this big fly far enough. So I'm just going to troll back and forth and back and forth and up and down. And all the fish see anymore is big flies. You wouldn't believe how many big fish are now getting caught on tiny little flies on those bodies of water because everybody else is trying to throw something 10 to 14 inches long. And now all of a sudden the guy that threw that three inch fly that was after walleye is catching all these giant pike. Throw what they don't see or throw what's natural to their forage fish. If you're fishing somewhere for pike or muskie or brown trout where they're commonly foraging off of an eight inch bait fish, or you're somewhere where the brown trout are commonly feeding off of, you know, stocked rainbows that are six to nine inches long, that can be a great size fly to throw for a brown trout. If the only thing that they're feeding on for bait fish is a little, you know, emerald shiner and like three inches is big, then throw a three inch fly. All right, this one cracks me up. Um, color, I've been so guilty of this where you get in that mindset that I'm looking for a reaction. I'm looking for a predatory strike. I don't care, like obviously these are bigger flies in this photo, like these are some musky flies from a musky trip we were doing. But I do the exact same thing when I'm trout fishing where you're thinking predatory response means they're gonna hit it because I pissed them off. I'm not trying to appeal to a sense of food or a sense of hunger. So I'm not trying to match anything. Obviously, I mean, look at these colors. Has anybody seen a naturally colored chartreuse or yellow bait fish swimming around? Like a yellow dungeon 
what does that imitate that's real? Are bright pink flies? I've never seen a bright pink bait fish yet. We catch a lot of fish on them and we get into this mindset that color doesn't matter because it's all about aggression. I've had so many days where I hadn't changed flies, I hadn't changed flies. I'm really guilty of this when I'm personal fishing. When I'm guiding, I'm way more apt to change flies. But we take a day off and we're fishing on our own and I'm just like, oh, whatever. Like they're going to eat it. I'm putting it where it needs to be. They'll eat it. Haven't changed flies for four hours. Haven't moved a fish in half an hour. All of a sudden you change flies, nothing, change flies, nothing. And you just start sticking fish after fish after fish because you change colors. You don't learn anything unless you cut the fly off that's working and go back to another color. Maybe the whole river turned on. That's really hard to do when you're guiding though. When someone's had a tough morning and they haven't got a fish and you change color and you change color and you finally find a color and they're hooking a bunch of fish, you're like, cool, let's take that off. And they're like, you're freaking nuts. <laughs> like, no, you're not taking that off. I finally started catching fish. Stop being an idiot. Let me catch fish. It's amazing how often the first color you find that triggered that take is working this much better. Like this is what you're doing now where we're at, but there's another color that's actually doing this, right? And you don't know unless you switch flies and keep changing flies. Maybe it's just a timing that the whole river turned on and it doesn't matter what color. So often it's color. Um, Brian, you know, Stephen Palmer down in Plano. Yep. So he brought a group up. And he's fishing out of the back of the boat and he's got his um, customer up in the front of the boat. And we were fishing Crelux minnows on the bow. I've never had a forecast sequence like what Steven pulled off. He hooked four fish on four consecutive casts. He finally stuck, he trout set every one of them and I just about beat him up with my hat. And he's a very large man, especially compared to me. Great dude though. Um, he missed those first three so badly. He landed the fourth one. The fourth one was a 24 inch rainbow that was completely dwarfed by the previous three fish. Was not even in the same class as those previous three fish. And it went male brown, female brown, male brown, where we know it was three different fish and it wasn't the same fish that chased downstream or something. All this was in like a 20 yard chunk, which is so rare to have three fish or four fish that large, that close together all on the same fly that his guest in the front of the boat was fishing the same fly, a Crelix minnow, in the same size with one out of the two colors the same, who wasn't touching a fish. It was bronze and emerald that was working magically. And Steven looks at me and goes, you gotta give him another one of those flies, put another one back on Sunland. I'm going, dude, I can't, you guys have lost all of them. I started the day with a box full of them, that's the last one. Steven cut it off of his line, put it onto Sun's line, and he immediately started catching fish. They were standing 14 feet apart in the same boat, casting to the same water. When Steven fished the gold with bronze, gold with black, gold with any other color, it made no difference. He was hooking fish occasionally. Whoever had the golden emerald was hooking fish at a ridiculous pace. I have no idea why. We don't have a gold and a green bait fish. That was the color that worked like that that day. It was unbelievable. There can, there's such a thing as a color bite. Uh, Kelly Gallup talks about it a lot where he has a set color rotation where he starts with one color, works his way through the colors and then starts over again. Don't get hung up on this color worked yesterday. So it's gotta be the color that's working today or this color was working this morning. So I'm gonna stick with it. it I'm so guilty of this getting hung up on one color because I think I just, you know, we're going for an aggression strike. So that's all it is. Um, number five, this one I think is, is a bit of a confusing one and it doesn't really apply if you're fishing somewhere where you're only allowed to fish one fly. So here we're allowed to fish multiple flies in Alberta. Um, and so we can put two streamers together and the streamers that I pair together are it's there's nothing that makes my brain hurt as much or there's as much smoke coming out of my ears as when I'm trying to figure out what two streamers you can see I've got one fly in my mouth and I'm trying to figure out the second fly to put on there I want two streamers that are going to move completely differently in the water if one is going to be 
pushing water. I want the other one that's going to be a very slim profile and dark. If one has really bright colors, I want the other to be very muted colors. If one's really dark, I want the other to be very light. I don't want two flies moving through the water in unison. If they move the same way, that's going to look very unnatural. Even if you're talking about a swarm of bait fish, they all are moving together, but no two of them move exactly the same. So I want one that when this one darts, this one pulls, and then this one dives and this one starts to float. So I try and get two flies that move very differently than each other when I'm pairing them. Two flies that move in unison and they're the same color and they both do the exact same thing. It's a real red flag that it's not natural. And so I try and avoid that at all costs. Number six, strip speed and cadence is huge. And I see so many people, this gets really, really hard to remember when the fishing has been slow. When the fishing has been slow and you zone out, just about everybody goes to this default cadence where it's just like strip, they're not going to eat, 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 they're not going to eat. And now all of a sudden your fly starts moving through the water exactly the same. You need to play with your strip speed. Um, when the water's really dirty, I'll see people like, oh, I'm, I'm going to bomb the banks with streamers. And you see them cast and they're ripping so fast. And it's like, the water's so dirty, there's six inches of visibility. Their strip is super fast and it's 18 inches long. So in one strip, that fly is completely gone from that fish's visibility, right? That speed, I'm going to slow down incredibly if I'm dealing with really stained water, right? And so making sure, change your strip speed. Don't strip at the same cadence. Don't strip at the same speed. Cold water versus warm water can make a huge difference. The reason this picture of the pike's up, a lot of our early season pike fishing, we do when the water is so cold that you're literally just crawling that fly along the bottom. And the reason that fly anglers, like I've guided for pike at um, northern lodges where, you know, fly in lodges where you go up there. And it's one of the few places where fly anglers will, will seriously outfish the gear guys is because first thing in the spring when that water's super cold and those fish are super sluggish, they don't want to expend a bunch of energy chasing. Crankbaits, spoons, spinner baits, most of your terminal tackle needs motion to impart the activity into that bait. A fly, you can twitch it and then it can flutter and stop. And you can pick it up and drop it. The exception for the terminal guys is the guys that fish sluggos. When they fish those big like 10 inch sluggos, th those guys destroy. They do it amazingly well for that same reason. It's not moving quickly. Hmm. I had a time that I'll, I had a buddy, he'll never let me forget this. There were three of us fishing together. Two of us were catching fish virtually every cast. They weren't big pike like this. They were little hammer handles, little snot rockets, ditch pickles, whatever you want to call them tons of them two of us caught over 100 each the other guy did not hook one fish we gave him the spot that we were using we gave him the flies that we were using the only difference is he refused to do a hand twist that we were doing because he's like pike are aggressive i had a pike rip a rod out of my hand i'm gonna strip quickly a pike should hit that we were doing a hand twist like you would do if you were fishing chronomids or damsels or leeches just dragging them across the bottom and hooking fish after fish after fish. That third guy fishing the same fly did not touch a fish in an entire day when there was over 200 fish caught by the other two. The only difference came down to the strip speed. Make sure your strip speed matches the fish's activity level. Okay. Cadence is another big one. Um, this is where you kind of need to be able to read body language. There's two examples here. On the right-hand side, we've got a tarpon there. That's Cuba. Um, it's a guest that was on a hosted trip with me. Um, this guy wanted a tarpon so bad and just wasn't reading that body language cues. And he wasn't changing his cadence. The first time I ever fished in Belize uh, for tarpon, the guy looked at me and he says, Mom, if you're being chased, would you keep walking at the same speed? Valid point. I probably would not, right? If you think your life is in danger, you are not going to continue walking at the exact same speed. So when a predator starts chasing its prey, it makes sense for the prey to change its cadence and speed up and go faster. 
what will that do typically? It typically gets the predator more excited. Why do we tell people not to run from a bear? Right? It's because if you run, now you look like prey. Now they get excited and go, if it's running away, maybe I'm supposed to eat it. So I, I go eat it. Right? You need to read that fish's body language and match the cadence. If that fish starts chasing it off and you start speeding up too fast, that fish might start to lose interest and drifts away. Stall that fly, and all of a sudden you see that fish come right back. This brown trout on the left hand side, it's a little, it's not the bow, it's a little, uh, a stream we have in southern Alberta and I had a buddy rowing and I threw this cast and the fly landed and the fish boiled immediately. That fish chased and chased and chased actually sorry this is a different fish. That fish chased without me recasting for probably a minute and a half where all I could do was throw a mend let the current catch it and swing the fly to speed it up and it would come back and then as it started to slow down the fish would lose interest and so I had to change it. And I kept changing the cadence and changing the speed. And it would start to swim away and you speed it up and it would come right back. But then it started getting too fast and it didn't want to get that far from the shore in its little spot and it would start going back. You stall the fly and it would come right back to it. If you let it approach a fly stalled, it would lose interest and leave again. So you had to continuously change the cadence of the strip to keep that fly interested. I've had guys cast to the shoreline have a fish boil, have it come all the way off the shoreline, 30 feet to the boat, all the way around the bow of the boat, and hook it at the oar on the far side of the boat. Because they were reading and reacting that fish, what it was doing. They sped up when it started to lose interest, and then all of a sudden slow down when it starts to think it's getting away because it's going too fast. It's a hard thing to do and to learn, but if you can learn to read a fish's body language and adjust the cadence of your strip, you will hook exponentially more fish on streamers if you can adjust that cadence to their body language. Okay, last one. Again, it comes down to that same sort of thing, presentation. You have to make sure that ultimately, at the end of all of these things that you've avoided and you figured out what line you wanna do and you figured out what they're doing and where they're sitting and that, if my presentation doesn't match the situation I'm dealing with, I'm going to be in a lot of trouble. These are two fish that are caught out of the Bow River in completely different conditions. On the left-hand side, that brown trout was caught in middle of August when the water had been super clear, like you see on the right-hand side, and then we had a huge rainstorm. Huge rainstorm, blew the river out, river was filthy, dirty, big fish started to feed. I have to make sure that my presentation is appropriate for dirty water. I need to make sure I throw a fly in terms of color and size that is more likely to be felt and seen in dirty water. So something with a darker profile like blacks, dark olives, chocolate colored browns, purple, something that's gonna throw a good profile when they can't see as well. If I throw some of those really heavy profile flies or much bigger flies in the same scenario at this rainbow on the right hand side, that could spook that fish so hard that they're gone. That fish in the really clear water needed me to adjust to a less aggressive stripping technique. I had to have a smaller fly. I had to have something that wasn't as kind of gaudy and in their face. So you need, you need to make sure that your presentation matches the fish that you're seeing, right? In that muddy water, I can't do big giant long strips because big giant long strips, that flies immediately out of sight. You know, in that super clear water, I don't want to wait until the fly is right in front of the fish before I move it because that fish can probably see my fly from 20 feet away when the water's that clear. So I can start moving it very early on to make sure that that fish is aware of that and I'm not waiting until it's right in front of them and now I spook them, right? I'm going to have to wait in the dirty water to do that. So just make sure that you address your presentation at the end of all of that. You got to make sure your presentation matches um, the actual setting that you have. That's kind of two presentations jammed together in a nutshell. Um, I know some people may have to go. I'm happy to stay for as long as anybody wants in terms of questions. Uh, I'll open it up now, Brian, you guys in the floor. Anybody has questions, fire away. Yeah, questions, please please go right ahead, shout out. You either use the chat room or go ahead and ask him right away. I don't have a question, but I just want to say that's an awesome presentation. Love your energy, love your passion. 
love your knowledge. Thank you for sharing. Thank you, and you're welcome. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Lots of tips. I have a, a quick question about your um, photography. Sure. Um, sure. What kind of uh, equipment are you using? Like what lens? And uh, to, to capture some of those uh, really great pictures. Um, Brian's laughing because he's probably seen my camera bag and knows that it's my body weight in camera lenses. Well, I shoot on Canon. I have uh, a 7D Mark II um, and a 5D Mark II. Typically, I have the full frame sensor camera okay. inside the underwater housing and the 7D outside. Um, yeah, I shoot on a mix of everything from prime lenses to fish eyes to telephotos yeah it's i guess typically when you're uh, trying to capture the the sipping of the fly is that usually a telephoto to get you that close yeah okay yeah for sure and typically that would be on either the 100 to 400 um and uh, on that 7d with the crop sensor that has a 1.6 times factor and so you're actually shooting at up to 600 mils and I've also shot uh, a fair bit in recent years too with uh, a buddy has a 600 mil um, F4. And so that, again, when you put that on the crop sensor is a 900 mil. Wow. Equivalent. Okay. So sucker's awesome. heavy. It's like my body weight to haul around. Well.